So I invite you to now turn to the third panel that you have in your worship bulletin and you'll find the scripture today. The Epistle of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Now, Paul was a, uh, a follower of Jesus and the earliest writings we have are his letters, his correspondence, somewhere around the time of 50 AD. Okay, so about 20 years after, after Jesus' crucifixion and, and that whole, whole uh, story. And uh, 1 Thessalonians was the oldest book we have in the New Testament, and Romans uh, followed a little later. This is a... Uh, uh, Romans tends to be not so much a personal letter like Philippians or others that are very, very heartfelt. This one tends to be a little more uh, creedal or doctrinal as Paul is trying to develop a theology, kind of a framework around to uh, a framework around what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Remember, uh, there was no such thing as a church that we would think of it, or as they didn't call them Christians at this time. They were still primarily Jews that were followers of Jesus. And Paul has broken out in the sense that his market has become more of the goy, as they're called, the Gentiles. Uh, and so this is written to those people in Rome. Remember, there are many, many, many uh, Jewish settlements all around uh, the world at that time, and not as many as there would be in about 20 years later, because every time Jerusalem or Israel was conquered, they dispersed the people, uh, usually by slavery. And so there were pockets of Jews all around uh, the Mediterranean, and of course, uh, some of them, because of the message that's carried out, uh, convert and become followers of Jesus as well. This text is the one that Martin Luther, as he was evaluating what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, began to uh, coalesce his thinking that led to the, the break from the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, his father wanted him to be a lawyer. Um, he kind of rebelled and became a priest. Uh, and priests in those days, at least those in the cities, because the average monk probably wasn't even literate at that time, which is why the church had so much power. You know, the scriptures are written in Latin. How many people could really speak Latin? And how many people could really read? So what they were told is, is what they believed. But there was a segment of them, like Martin Luther, who were college professors as well. They had a high level of education. So he didn't become an attorney, he became a priest. And Martin Luther, uh, you read his earliest writings, uh, he lived in great fear of, of hell, great fear of ending his life and uh, not being right with God. Uh, that is probably a far, far cry from most people these days, I would submit because our mortality is not in front of us all the time the way it was then. You know, when you don't expect, or the average male lives to be maybe 30 years old, uh, over 50% of the women died in childbirth, well over 50% of the children died before they reached adulthood. Uh, with battles between uh, feudal lords or battles between different uh, groups of people, the Huns invading and different things of this nature, they were always afraid of dying. And once again, that's why the church had as much power as it did. And Luther was one of those, was very, very afraid that he would die and not be right with God. And so he was extraordinary in his discipline and his practices. And one day, the story is that he wrote this, he read this scripture, and his light went on in his mind, and he said, I got it all wrong. In my effort to be the best follower of Jesus, the best Christian, the best priest I could be, I fell victim to the worst sin of all, pride. He said, I, you know, every time I take a step forward, I'm prouder and prouder and prouder of myself. I get puffed up and I look at other people. And he said, that's, that's, I'm no better than anybody else and maybe more guilty. 
And so when he looked at this uh, passage, and of course we uh, Protestants who are familiar with this kind of quoted as saved by faith through grace. This is where that comes from, that there is nothing that we do that earns us God's grace. God's grace is available to all, all the time. And it is our faith that leads us into that grace by which we are saved. Not by what we do, but because God is a saver. Okay? So I invite you to follow along. Uh, the sermon title is uh, What Now? But I might, have changed, I might have changed it. Now, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. The scripture. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment God has already thrown open the divine doors to us. That's an amazing statement, that it's already waiting. We just need to open our doors and the connection is made. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise because there's more to come, always more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we are hemmed in with troubles. Why? Because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience and how that patience in turn can forge the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God is about to do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we, never, we are never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of incredible language here. May God bless the reading of this word, the hearing of the word, and most of all, the living of this word. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen.